We don't expect you to be as animated as David Wu there, but uh, he, he did express a lot of optimism, uh, not only about achieving some type of trade deal, but really about what that would mean for market sentiment and potentially, uh, I guess, underpinning the economy. Uh, should we get that deal? Should we get a little more clarity, at least, uh, on that deal? Uh, how much of an impact do you think that's going to have on market sentiment? I think there's still room for the market to run to the extent that we do get a trade deal, simply because there's still a lot of uncertainty baked in. We've seen some positive movement when it comes to trade, and then we walk, you know, a couple days later, there's some negative momentum that happens. So, you know, to the extent it gets resolved, we think there will be a positive impact to the overall equity markets, and you could see spreads continue to tighten on the bond side as well. You definitely get the feeling that the White House is watching how the stock market reacts very, very carefully every time they say something. We got this incredibly strong economic data, the jobs report today. Does the strong data reduce the urgency of striking a deal for the White House? Because now they have some room, right? The U.S. economy is doing well. We're not desperate. We have leverage, supposedly. Yeah, I mean, the jobs number today was clearly strong. I mean, you do have to take in consideration the fact that, um, you know, with the auto strike, 41,000 jobs or so were added back in that came back, uh, came back into the labor market. So that takes a little bit out of uh, over the top line number. But clearly it gives, uh, it gives the administration some room to, to maneuver to your point around the equity markets have responded very favorably today. So it probably gives them a little bit more comfort that uh, they have some time to, to negotiate this out to some degree. But we'll have to wait and see. Well, so, I mean, when we talk about the equity market response to this, there is some concern that the market has sort of been front-running a lot of the good news. I mean, obviously, the market always tries to front-run mm -hmm. things. But the idea is that it maybe it's gotten a little bit too far ahead of itself here, particularly when the data we've gotten has still been relatively inconsistent on a month-to-month -month basis. Uh, when you look at where valuations are right now in U.S. equities, mm -hmm. do you think it's justified uh, those valuations are justified given the backdrop that we have heading into 2020. I think when, at the end of the day, when you take a look at, um, you know, there is still a significant amount of uncertainty out there in trade. A deal has not been done yet. Um, and you look at valuations to your, to your point. I mean, when we look at our expectations for U.S. equity returns over the next decade, we have somewhat muted return expectations on an annualized basis for the next 10 years of slightly below five percentage points, which is substantially lower than what we just saw a decade ago. So what we're trying to advise investors is to really think about, you know, number one, um, diversification, making sure that they have exposure, not just to the U.S. markets, but the international markets where valuations aren't as stretched as what we see in the U.S., but they're also, also taking into consideration the fees that they're being charged when it comes to the investments that they're making, because that's one thing they can control. Yeah, that's uh, the Vanguard playbook right there, I know. talking about lower <laughs> fees. Um, we can get to that in a moment, but I want to pick up on the point that perhaps looking abroad is a way to find some value. The big call right now is for international markets to outperform the U.S. in 2020. Is that getting to be a crowded call? Do you see people positioning for that now? You know, when we take a look at cash flows that we've seen coming into Vanguard this year, so year to date, 70% of the cash flows have been driven into fixed income as well as money markets. So we're not seeing that trade into mm. international equity specifically. And if you look at the industry more broadly, the majority of the cash flows have also gone into fixed income and money markets, and you continue to see outflows coming out of the equity markets. So we don't think it's crowded at this point in time. There's still opportunities there. But if you're a believer in this idea of sort of a rebound in growth and global growth, and then you look at the valuations here, and then you look at what we're seeing in Europe and elsewhere, doesn't it kind of make sense that you would then try to reposition a little bit more heavily or at least increase your weight uh, in Europe, for say? Yeah, I mean, we would agree. I mean, when we look at our return expectations for the international market, so looking at equities outside the U.S., the return expectations there over the next decade are closer to 7.5% on an annualized basis. So a pretty nice premium relative to what we're expecting in the U.S. So for those investors who, you know, because U.S. equities have outperformed international, there's clearly a need to rebalance into some of these, um, you know, other markets that you may be underweight relative to what your, your starting position would have been. Right. You talked about how there are a lot of inflows into fixed income. Mm -hmm. Where are they going and what are the prospects for those parts of the market showing gains in 2020? I mean, a big part of it has been into, um, again, money markets has been a big area, but then we've also seen it into... Uh, primarily credit-related funds. So yep. people are trying to pick up incremental yield above and beyond what you would get in the Treasury market. So, again, you're looking at whether or not it's the short end of the curve or the intermediate part of the curve. Because the curve has been so flat, people haven't been rewarded for going way out to the long end. So we've been seeing more flows in the short and intermediate parts of the curve.